So I am Eric Lutzone. I'll be talking about uh, our uh, work using photonic crystal biosensors in the Cunningham lab uh, for the characterization of cell attachment. Uh, so it's a 15 minute talk. I thought maybe I could do without an outline, but just so you know, there's an end in sight. Um, we'll be talking about uh, photonic crystal enhanced microscopy, which is a new technique we've developed, and then we'll uh, specifically uh, use it to study how two different cell types uh, interact with one another um, in, a, in a sort of co-culture environment. So there are a few different uh, ways to analyze cell attachment or quantify cell attachment uh, and using label-free techniques, uh, including SPR imaging, uh, impedance-based imaging, and interferometric uh, techniques. And then uh, we have photonic crystals uh, that we're hoping to add um, to, that, to that list of techniques. So to perform this imaging, we take advantage of some of the far field properties of PC biosensors, uh, which, are, which basically consists of the fact that if we take a photonic crystal, which is basically a uh, repeating grading structure that uh, is laid down on top of a low refractive index substrate, uh, and then we use a high refractive index coating uh, to, to get this uh, repeating uh, photonic crystal structure. If we shine uh, a broad wavelength of light uh, at that crystal and then look at the reflected light, we can see a, a peak reflectance uh, or a dip in transmission. So here's just a little bit of characterization of our sensors. Uh, we use a, 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 low, a low refractive index photoreplicable moldable um, PET uh, for the foundation of the grating. And uh, then we use, uh, we are, as a high refractive index coating, we use uh, titanium dioxide. And we can be relatively flexible in manufacturing these sensors. So here's our, here are a couple sensors affixed to uh, standard microscope slides. We can also uh, fabricate similar sensors uh, and affix them to uh, microplates. So here's a little bit of characterization for the specific sensors that I'll be uh, talking about today. Um, basically, our, our resonant wavelength is around uh, 633 or 638, and then our resonant angle um, is at about three three and a quarter degrees for this for this sensor. So, in addition to being able to quantify shifts in the resonant wavelength as a result of uh, localized refractive index change, uh, we can quantify uh, shifts in the resonant angle as well. And it'll become a little more clear uh, what I mean by wavelength and angle uh, over the next few slides. So uh, another interesting property of these sensors is that uh, when large items or when uh, proteins, uh, basically anything with a, with a refractive index that differs from that of the surrounding environment, uh, comes within a close range of the sensor, so within a couple hundred nanometers, that structure can actually couple into the electric field created by our photonic crystal. And by doing so, uh, it will change the, the resonant characteristics of the sensor uh, over that area. And so here, we see that if we scan over a range of angles, so if you look at the plot, um, we can scan over a range of angles and see that there's a dip in transmission at what we call a resonant angle. So our instrumentation is basically a uh, standard fluorescence microscope uh, with the addition of an angle tunable translational mirror, which is shown in the lower uh, left hand corner. And uh, by adding this mirror, we can take a series of images over a range of incident angles and then uh, compute the angle of minimum transmission, which is our resonant characteristic. Uh, so here are just a, a, few, a few images walking us through the process. Uh, so if you look at uh, panel A in the top left, we have uh, basically a bright field image of, some, of, of a few cells we have in culture. And then if we take uh, the red pixel and the blue pixel and plot out uh, the intensity of transmission that those receive, that those areas of the sensor receive over a range of angles, we can see that uh, the area of cell attachment in, in the blue curve uh, shows a lower angle of incidence, a lower angle of minimum transmission than the, the red pixel. And so then if we map all of the pixels in the, in our, in the field collected by our CCD, we can see that uh, we have relative, relative peaks or relative uh, 
increases in the shift of angle of minimum transmission corresponding with the areas of cell attachment. And we believe this to be due to uh, the, the cells actually laying down uh, a proteinaceous attachment or a protein matrix over those areas. And so here we, uh, in, in one of our first papers, we, uh, d using this technique, we looked at how apoptosis could, could affect uh, this cell attachment and whether we could measure it using our technique. And we see that in the, in the top set of panels, we can see a cell that has outstretched uh, cell attachments. And then after we induce apoptosis, uh, we see um, kind of retraction of those attachments and rounding up of the cell body. And that correlates with a, uh, with a return of, of that area of cell attachment on the, on the green curve. Uh, it, it looks more like uh, the, the area off the cell uh, after we induce that treatment, after we induce that cell death. So one of the problems that, that we hope to address uh, using this technique is that of specific apoptotic recognition. So when cells undergo uh, program cell death, they actually display a number of residues that indicate uh, something about that cell death. And so they, they either indicate that it's a benign process or that uh, it needs to be cleaned up by local histiocytes or macrophages in a certain way. And, and so basically it's a, way for the, it's a way for the dying cell to educate its neighbors about the process that caused its death. And so today we'll be looking at how our, our model uh, apoptosing cells or, or cells undergoing apoptosis interact with our responder cells. And so our, our target cells are, will be uh, a T cell line where we are, are capable of inducing apoptosis. And then our, uh, our responder cells, our, our local histiocytes, macrophages, um, we're, we're, we're currently using uh, HEK cells, HEK derived uh, cells for that. So uh, current detection methods for this type of interaction rely on fluorescence and proliferation and tracking uh, cell populations over a number of days. Now, this kind of removes you a few steps from the event with which you're concerned and doesn't uh, really have single cell resolution. Um, it also requires that you know the specific markers that you're interested in, in working with prior to your experiment. So you can't go in blind uh, and, and really learn something about your system. So with a label-free approach, we hope to we hope to change that. And basically, uh, this is a this little animation is going to is going to show us how the responder assay works. Uh, so we we culture our responder cells first on the sensor, and then wait for them to attach, which we register as a shift in wavelength. And then we add our target cells, uh, which have uh, maybe been treated to induce apoptosis or or maybe not, and then see basically how those cells interact with our responder cells. And so in certain situations, uh, if these, if these uh, target cells are undergoing apoptosis, certain cell types will, will respond and increase their attachment. Uh, other, other cell types will, or, or benign conditions, will not elicit that same increase in attachment. So if we have a label-free way uh, to, to basically quantify this increase in cell attachment, we can, we can get it characterizing that interaction without the use of fluorescent labels. So here we have, uh, we, we basically performed that experiment and multiplexed it in uh, multi-well plates and uh, basically found that at a 30 minute uh, interval, we have maximal shift between the different uh, treatment conditions. And so the maximal shift is seen with our uh, apoptotic cells added at a 10 to one ratio and at about 30 minutes. Um, after treatment, and then the, the line of triangles indicates the addition of viable cells, which induced a, a shift in cell attachment, but not that much from the responder cells. And then if we, uh, if we don't add anything at all, we see uh, a minimal shift um, that, that, kind of, that kind of falls over time. And so if we move on and, and try and characterize this at a higher resolution uh, using our angle-based setup, uh, the, the microscope, uh, basically, we can see that we can basically find these areas of cell attachment uh, using our bright field mode and uh, then perform our AMT assay 
and look for cells that have an increased area of cell attachment. And then after we add our, our targets, uh, we note that, that, those, that those cells that have had a, a good attachment to begin with have a markedly increased attachment uh, after, after treatment. And so if we uh, quantify and basically look at a number of these cells, uh, count them and average them, we can see that uh, prior to target addition, there are relatively similar levels of attachment. Uh, Post-target addition, we see uh, increases in attachment density in response to the addition of apoptotic cells. Uh, and then just to, to make it a little bit easier to look at these, uh, at, at, at these graphs, we've subtracted the difference. And so the bottom uh, net AMT shift, we can see that a, a one to one ratio of, of apoptotic to, uh, to, to responder cells is, results in a, a greater AMT shift than a, a lower ratio or a one to 10 uh, apoptotic to responder ratio. Uh, basically uh, showing that there's a dose dependent response in terms of uh, this uh, response to apoptotic or display of apoptotic uh, antigen. So in conclusion, we've shown that uh, we can measure cell matrix interactions uh, nearing the, the single cell level with, with our new approach. Uh, and we've demonstrated that we can detect cell-cell signaling uh, and, and interactions between multiple cell types. And uh, through a combination of high throughput and high resolution methods, uh, we can kind of use our label-free techniques to uh, understand uh, which interactions or which, which cell types we might uh, want to take a closer look at and maybe uh, invest some time in finding specific interactions and specific markers. And so with that, um, I'd just like to thank you for your time and attention, and uh, I'll, I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh, I forgot. It's uh, sorry. It's it's actually uh, a couple days after uh, Marty McFly returned to the future. So I don't know how many of you have received this internet meme via email, but uh, Marty McFly should be around somewhere. We have time for this question. Uh, sure. So thank you, Eric. Uh, I have a question about the, the sort of ratios. Is there a reason why you think you were getting a higher response to the one-to-one -one interaction as opposed to the, the ten-to-one interaction? Is it, is it, did you get a sense of that even though you had a ten-to-one ratio, was it really ten-to-one interactions, or is it still was there? It, it would seem kind of good if you see it. Sure. Uh, so that's actually. Um, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit difficult. So we actually found that um, our, our, so our one-to-one -one ratio here is um, a one-to-one -one ratio of responders to, uh, um, I'm sorry, our one-to-one -one ratio here is uh, our ratio of targets to responders. So it's, so I may, perhaps I misspoke. Um, so the higher, basically the higher concentration of targets gave us a higher response here. Um, so, so, this, so this does make sense. When we switch to imaging, um, to doing our, our high resolution imaging, uh, we found that if we use those, the, the same concentrations we used in the, in the low, uh, the, basically the, the high throughput system, if we use those concentrations, uh, we basically couldn't image the cells based on uh, how many floating cells were, were kind of passing through our, our field as we, as we uh, imaged our series. So it was kind of difficult to, to get a sharp image with those concentrations. Um, I understand that um, when they sell the weightings, uh, optical, um, uh, the line crystals, mm -hmm. uh, the line structures, they sell the data the resonance uh, peak shift. So what causes this kind of uh, resonance peak shift? Is it just because of the so the so because the surrounding medium in this instance is is closer to that of water, um, we kind of reference our our shifts of of angle of minimum transmission uh, from basically what the what the medium is without the presence of cells. So we take a, a background image of uh, basically just the the sensor with with cell medium on it. 
and then we add our cells, allow them time to, to attach, and then take another measurement and subtract the difference. So what we believe that we're imaging uh, as, as, as a result of that, um, uh, that cell attachment and increased protein deposition is the increased refractive index uh, of the protein with respect to the, the medium, uh, so which, you know, which has some serum protein floating around, but hopefully not as much as the, as the, cells, uh, as the attachments the cells are putting down. So in terms of the refractive index change, because all the cells have pretty much the same low composition, how about the selectivity of this? So this assay has zero selectivity. Uh, the way that we can uh, kind of bypass that is if we uh, introduce um, uh, some sort of specificity. So we can code our sensors with uh, you know, different growth, growth factors or different, uh, different proteins. So, so we have some other experiments uh, where we've coded with collagen and fibronectin to, and, and cultured fibroblasts, or I'm, I'm sorry, cultured, uh, cultured fibroblasts, uh, cultured uh, myocardial uh, cells. And we've seen that the myocardium can, can grow basically, that the myocytes can grow uh, if those factors are present. But if they're not present, the cells basically uh, round up, uh, stay, on the verge of viable for a couple of days and then eventually die. Thank you. No problem. Okay, that's time. Have a good one. Thank you.